Well, well thank you all for being here um, at our Open San Diego's first Meet the Candidate event. Um, this is my first time doing this, so, so bear with me, and hopefully it will go well. Um, for those of you who don't know, Open San Diego is a, a group of volunteers um, who work with local government to, to assist them in using technology better. Um, and I want to, first of all, thank our, our, our sponsors today. Um, uh, first of all, uh, the San Diego Foundation, who was kind enough to put us up and give us this, this nice location. Uh, and then uh, Code for America, uh, who was nice enough to pay for the beer. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, maybe I should have listed them first. Uh, <laughs> Very awesome. So uh, with us is, is Carol Kim, who uh, made it through the, the, the primary um, and is now in a runoff for District 6 to be our, our, our next San Diego council member. Um, and uh, Carol, um, before we get into the tech issues, mm -hmm. what I first want to do is, is, is give you a chance to introduce yourself to, to, to the people here a little bit better. And let's, let's start with just the, the, the some quick facts. Okay. Democrat, Republican, or Independent? I'm a Democrat. Um, Mac, Windows, or Linux? Mac, <laughs> though formerly Windows, but now Mac. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, baseball, football, or football? Baseball. Um, stone, ballast point, <laughs> or, or uh, modern times? Oh, that's hard. <laughs> that's a mean question. <laughs> We're going to lose constituents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should, I should go, mm. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm going to lose, well, you know, all of the San Diego local craft breweries do excellent work and create Sorry. wonderful products, so they're fantastic, they're all good. Well Cough out of an answer, <laughs> but, but, but acceptable. Um, okay, so what, what else should, should people know about you? Why are you doing this? Why, why, why do you want to be a council member? You know, um, that's a really good question, and I get asked that a lot, uh, especially because I'm not from politics, right? I am actually, my background is in education and human services, so I started off as a public school teacher. I worked several years in HIV prevention, and for the past seven and a half years, I've been working for an education nonprofit, where I do, I write grants for public school districts, I do trainings for teachers and principals, and I do evaluations of grant-funded programs, where I go into school districts and I help measure the efficacy and success and um, whether or not programs are meeting goals and how, c how we can improve them and all that kind of stuff. So that's the kind of work I do. I have two kids, they're nine and five, I'm married, um, homeowner, all that sort of thing. Volunteer in the, in the community school and neighborhood where my kids go. So I get asked this question a lot because people will say, you seem so normal. <laughs> <laughs> and my answer is, you know, I'm doing this because it matters. It really matters, you know, there's these really important decisions being made every day that impact our lives every day. And we should have voices in the city hall, in the council, who are really advocating for the people and the businesses that live and work inside the districts. So I'm hoping to be able to do that. And also people who are really invested in the communities that they're living in and want to really see them grow and prosper and just do awesome stuff. So. That's, this is why, and I, feel, I also feel, just at a very basic level, that we need to have ownership of our government, particularly our local government. So that means people like me, ordinary people, should be stepping up and being willing to do this work. So, there you go. Makes sense. Yeah. I, wouldn't, I still wouldn't do it, but I, <laughs> but I appreciate you trying. You should think about it. Everyone here should think <laughs> about it. Um, so, uh, I want to uh, move over to the tech issues, sure. which is what we're really here to talk about. Obviously. We want to start by talking about a couple of things that have been in the, the news recently. Um, so uh, email re the email retention policy, to, um, mm -hmm. th those of you who don't, don't know, uh, this, this has been something uh, that we've gone back and forth with in the city of San Diego um, uh, when, during uh, Todd Gloria's uh, mayorship. Um, uh, there was a policy implemented that, that email would be destroyed after two years. Mm -hmm. this is pretty common policy in a lot of corporations. Mm -hmm. uh, lawyers love it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but um, a lot of people in the, 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 the open government community and the tech community um, objected to it. And uh, Mayor Kevin Faulkner has put it on hold. Um, where do you stand on the issue? 
Well, I'm a proponent of transparent and open government. So for me, I feel like we should, as long as we can afford to keep it, which we should be able to do because there are so many solutions for that these days, we should be hanging on to it. I come from the human services and education background, and education records are kept like forever, basically. And human service records, especially like health records and that kind of stuff, we're required to keep those six, seven years minimum. So um, with that kind of thing, and for me, that two years, with, I mean, I've, we all talk about this, how the pace of government is as quick as molasses, right? It's incrementally slow. So two years can go by, a lot can happen or not a lot can happen. And a process for something, y it may take like 10, 20 years for it to actually come to completion. So for things to get destroyed after two years, it doesn't seem to make sense. So I think that we should be definitely hanging on to those longer. How long do you keep your personal email for? I My personal email, I don't know if I should admit this. <laughs> I don't delete emails. It's it's kind of the way I, it's like my storage system. You know, it's my backup, <laughs> you know, so I don't delete emails unless it's like serious spam, you know. And how yeah. much, is that costing you much? No, it doesn't cost <laughs> me anything. Okay. It's free. <laughs> Google and uh, Yahoo and all that stuff. Free. So so you'll remember that when, uh, in <laughs> City Hall, that, that it, it's yes. cost you nothing to save it forever. That's right. <laughs> um, so uh, the other thing that's been in the news a lot is is the open data policy. Have mm -hmm. you been following that? A little bit, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, uh, actually a lot of people in this room worked on uh, pushing forward an open data policy mm -hmm. and um, uh, trying to, to take a lot of the data that the city stores. Mm -hmm. The city has an absurd amount of data, you know, from water department, fire department, police department, every department keeps all sorts of records. Um, and that's all right now very much siloed and, and inaccessible um, often to that, o that department itself, certainly to other departments and definitely to the public as a whole. So the open data policy really says this data that belongs to the public, that's, uh, that's accessible according to uh, uh, Public Record Act requests, let's just get it out there. Let's, let's try and publish it in an easy to use format. So. Um, uh, at, at, at molasses speed, um, it's been a, a little bit over a year now since it was first brought up in, in, in uh, council committee. Um, it's now passed the rules committee unanimously. It's going to be going to city council soon. All right. Since we had five members vote for it on the rules committee, I think we'll pass city council. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we have this real potential to, to push forward open data. So um, where are you on open data? Do you support the policy? Are there changes you'd like to see made to it? I am a huge proponent of open data. I think it's important. Again, for me, um, being involved in government means that we have access. And access means not just having records that are PDF formats, because you know while we can read through pages and pages of reports and all that sort of thing, it's not necessarily as helpful as being able to actually manipulate it. So if I want to look at budgets, for instance, and mess around with some numbers, I'd like to be able to download it in usable format, like a CSV file or something, and be able to play with those numbers so I can figure out, you know, how do we best make these things work or how do we make things more efficient or streamlined, that sort of thing. So it's really, um, I'm a huge proponent of it. I think it's important. I do think we have to be careful to protect residents' privacy, that sort of thing. You know, those, those issues occur, especially when we're talking about government, of course. And I think it's important to, I guess, there's a, I, I don't know if you follow um, the New York stuff in New York City they did that mm. big apps thing and they, they've done some a lot of open data things New York has a great open data portal do. and there there was a there was something a friend of mine was actually talking about this with me just a little while ago he was telling me about this app they somebody created that um, I think tracked rats like public health <laughs> records of rats in buildings right mm. and this was great because people could then figure out where are the rats in New York City except it actually, when it came out, it really negatively impacts some of those local businesses that happened to be in buildings that were near <laughs> those infestation areas. Nobody wanted to go there anymore. Mm. So this is the kind of unintended consequence that we can sometimes come across when we're talking about technology usage, right? Which, because technology usage is, is disruptive, but it's also, you know, and it's disruptive in good ways, but it can also be disruptive in some negative ways. So I would say that I'm, like I said, I'm a huge proponent of it. I think it's awesome. I think we should be doing more of it because it does give people more access and gives people more channels to become engaged with their local government, have ownership, real ownership. Um, but that being said, we just have to be, 
you know, mo like, like cognizant of the things that could go wrong and make sure that we're trying to protect folks, you know, we don't want to put out, put like a whole section of like Hillcrest out of business because <laughs> there was something that happened, you know, that we, you know, that came out through the data. I guess, well, I guess it's important for people to know if there's rats, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in Hillcrest. There's not, I'm just making that up. It's a theory. It's a hypothetical. It's okay. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not your district. Yes, you could say that. <laughs> it's an example of a, of a possible scenario. But, so, um, but yeah, you know, I mean, just basically taking things into mind and making sure that we are, we're, we're, we're being thoughtful about how we implement and deploy those things. So since it would be very rude for me to, to, to tweet during the, this interview, sure. um, I'm going to ask somebody else who's tweeting to, 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 to highlight something <laughs> you just said. PDFs bad, CSVs good. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, so um, so in, in, your, in your work uh, with the, the education nonprofit, you said mm -hmm. you were doing um, uh, a lot of analytics work. Right. I well, I work with I work with statisticians. Okay. Yes, yeah. So, so we collect data and we do that sort of stuff. So have you started to think about what data sets in the city that you'd like to be able uh, to play with or send over to your statistician friends? I have actually thought about the fact that I want to hire one of them onto my staff, just so that we can have the capacity to be able to do some of that work. Um, you know. I haven't, I haven't actually thought about the specific data sets. I just always think of it in general, in terms of, I mean, definitely health data. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in that. Um, also, it, it'd be really interesting to be able to just track some of, the, some of the, the data that comes in regarding infrastructure and those kinds of issues and problems. But I, I would ask you, have you guys thought of any that you think need to be looked at? Um. Great question. Um, well, certainly in the budget. Mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, I think the budget's I, a, a no-brainer. First thing, right? Yeah. But budget is, is, is certainly a, a, t a top thing. Uh, the other one I, I personally put very high is uh, Public Record Act requests. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Oakland did a great system where there's now this, this um, open ticketing system That's for great. Public Record Act requests. You and can then get, does it track it? So you can go and see every Public Record Act request that's been submitted mm -hmm. and has it been responded to. Right. Um, which then gives you all, all sorts of data about um, what people are interested mm -hmm. in and where you might be able to find m more efficiencies. So in Oakland, actually, the number one request, and I don't know if San Diego would be the same, I, I would say, suspect it would be close, uh, are uh, police uh, reports. Mm. So that's Absolutely. one thing that people want to know. Sure. Um, and then, and then the third big one is actually just what I refer to as the list of lists. Right. What are what are all our data sets? So right. I think I think once we, we we need to know what we have out there to really be able to figure out um, uh, what we should be prying open. But but I think actually it's it, it it's really not so much for for people like me for technologists. It's for the communities and nonprofits and. Uh, and journalists, and mm -hmm, what mm -hmm. do they they want access to? Yeah, and I think I like what you said about the Public Records Act stuff because I can see how being able to really have access to that and making that very transparent also puts pressure on folks to respond to them. Um, right now, we don't really have any consequences for not responding in a timely manner. Right? In fact, there's no consequences even when people obstruct them. So. It'd be nice to be able to, at least, if we're not legislating those consequences, um, and I don't know if we need to, if we, if we create a situation where people um, feel pressure, social pressure, to actually respond, that might be enough, and that would be tremendous. That's a great idea. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about uh, three particular da data sets. Okay. And that is, um, if, if, if you are elected, um, your calendar mm -hmm. after the fact, your uh, office budget, Mm -hmm. and your email. Um, would you release all three of those in a um, open data format? Oh, that's a really good question. Well, my budget for sure. And my email, I could see it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can't imagine Christina. These are all things that are, are, are PR, PRAable. So, yes. so yes, we're absolutely. not asking you to sure. release anything that you wouldn't legally be right, required, required to. to just to do it um, just to pro do it ahead of time, yeah, ahead of time yeah, and I don't see why not in I a queryable format. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Of course, of course. So that you can actually query it. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Great. Okay. Um, sticking with the news, mm -hmm. um, the police department. Mm -hmm. So there's been a couple of things um, uh, in the news lately uh, with the police and with technology. Um, so I wanted to ask you about those. Uh, first of all, body cameras. 
What, do you, what, what are your thoughts on wearable body cameras for the police department? I like them. I think that it's a good idea. I think it, it actually, body cameras are an interesting thing because I think they tr create transparency for both sides, you know, for both the police officers and for citizens. So we're talking about an opportunity for folks to, one, um, not file fraudulent claims against the police officers for things that they feel, you know, for whatever reason. And then also a way for citizens to feel protected as well. So I'm a fan of the body cameras. I think that, I think, I think even the police officers are okay with it. There's, um, I can't remember what municipality it was. It's somewhere in the LA area yeah. that, uh, that used them. And they saw a tremendous decrease, like a significant decrease in the number of claims filed by people against the police about, mm -hmm. you know, and which was really an amazing thing, right? And we also saw a significant number of um, complaint, uh, just, a d they saw a decrease in a lot of things, like the, the co basically the complaints against citizens. So they saw overall people felt less vulnerable and also they were not filing against the officers themselves just because they wanted to, you know, push back at something. So it creates a real, like I said, transparency between both parties and all the stakeholders and I think that's a positive always. Who should control viewing of that? Is, is it, should, should it be the police department? Should it be some other entity? I think it needs to be the, some other entity for it to be as transparent as we're talking about. It, I mean, the police department should definitely see it and have access to it first and foremost because that's their, that's their data in terms of their producing it. But definitely there should be a third party entity, whether it's the city or whether it's some other, some other body that oversees those things, a commission or something that needs to be able to have access to it. Maybe the uh, uh, Citizens Review Board would have some ability to mm -hmm, open mm -hmm. that up? Definitely, yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know if you saw the news about, uh, I believe it was c it's called Operation Secure. Um, uh, Voice of San Diego across the hall here mm -hmm. uh, just did, did a report about this. This is a, was a program where the police would have access to uh, private uh, video camera feeds around oh the city. Interesting. Um, and uh, there about 50, 50 um, presume mostly businesses, signed up. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, while, uh, or fortunately, if you, you're, you found this a little bit creepy, um, the program's not working at all. Uh, most of the video cameras the police are unable to access due to technology problems. Mm -hmm. None of them can individual officers access from their cars because we don't have appropriate bandwidth right. to be able to see videos despite mm -hmm. them having extensive uh, systems in, in their cars. Mm -hmm. So it sort of gets into to sort of a bigger question about technology, at least in the ci city, uh, or at least in the police department, and maybe in the city as a whole. Um, and if, if you talk to the members of the police union about this, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you how unhappy they are with their technology from, from the payroll system, which takes too long to, to, to do their time cards, to their radios, which don't reliably work. Mm -hmm. How do we solve police technology? How do, how do we get technology working for the police department? Um, and when we're dealing with a limited budget um, and, and officers leaving, how do we balance the needs to improve our technology with the needs to put more more money to just uh, police retention? retention? Yeah, it's a real, it's, that's a very good question and I don't think there's a good answer for it currently. I don't think there's a really easy pragmatic solution because of the bureaucracy that's layered on top of what you're asking about. I mean, turning over our technology or switching that out for for new technology, we, there are inexpensive options that we can imagine. We could do all kinds of interesting, innovative ideas and bring those in. But I think um, in terms, when you're, every time you're looking at a government agency and the kinds of uh, requirements that are involved there, you're talking about serious you know, money and, and infrastructure. So there's the, I think that that's, I don't know how you, at this point, in the, in the in the state we're in, um, budget-wise, I don't know how we can actually afford to do both. But it, you're right, they have to happen. So that's a good question. I have to actually think more about that. And I, I don't have a quick, easy answer for it. And I think, I think if I did, I would be like winning the lottery, <laughs> right? I mean, we would, we would have answers for all kinds of things if that was the case. 
Um, yeah, we have to. We do have to address both. You're absolutely right. And the the technology. I actually went on a ride along with a police officer a few months ago, and the technology that they have in their cars. You know, have you have you ever been in one of those cars? I, I haven't. It? It's so they they've got these little laptops, and they you know they're 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 keying in things, and it's one of those systems where it looks like you know DOS. You know, <laughs> it's it's black with like green letters and like you know the little. I mean, it's not it's it's not something where, where that's user friendly or with an easy interface, no touch screen. Well, no, there's some touch screen, <laughs> but it's you know it's very. Um, it feels very primitive when you just look at it, right? So I feel like there are probably better, more streamlined options out there. I just don't have the details yet about how we could implement those or find those or, fi or get them involved. Like, I don't know why we can't just use iPads with apps, you know, <laughs> but in those, in those vehicles. But I'm sure there's reasons. And so maybe it's a matter of me just finding out those things and figuring out how we can work on that because that would be a lot cheaper probably than what they've got currently. Well, I, I, I wish I, I was hoping you'd have the answer because I'm not quite sure what the answer is yeah, either. Yeah, yeah, I know. We'll, we'll have to keep asking around. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of expensive, archaic systems, um, a, f a few years back, the, the, uh, when, when the city was going through uh, particular financial uh, problems, mm -hmm. um, uh, they implemented SAP. Uh, and uh, what, it, what was originally supposed to cost, I believe, about $20 million is now past $70 million. Mm -hmm. And, and the costs keep piling on. Sure. Um, what do you think we should do about that? Do we, keep, do we keep going forward with SAP? Do we pull the plug? Do we do something different? I would love to pull the plug on it. I mean, I feel like, it, and you know, I feel like it's, it's probably a little clunky, isn't it? I mean, from what I understand, it's supposed to be cutting edge and all that good stuff. But I've also heard that, you know, we've, we buy all these things and whenever we something comes up or a problem occurs and we say, why can't we fix this? People will say, well, you didn't buy that module, right? And so it's like, well, how much does it cost to have that module? Then and it's like, what do you mean? We, did, we just paid $50 million. What do, what do you mean we don't have it? And they're like, you don't have it, but you know, you can add it in for another $5 million. You know what I mean? So it's, it's this kind of thing. And um, I find that problematic. I would like to have um, an IT system or a platform in place for the city that's much more responsive, much more nimble, something that we could actually have our own technologists, like our own, we should have our own developers in-house who are able to just build the apps or build the things that they need and plug, them, plug and play. I mean, that seems to be what makes sense, what happens a lot in, in industry already and, you know, and so um, these these technologies, from what I understand, are totally available. I don't understand why we're not using them, especially if they are not as expensive and easier to use oftentimes. So, yeah. So, so you, you just said something really interesting there, that we should have our developers in-house. So, mm -hmm. so you, you may know the history of the San Diego Data Processing Corp. Um, right. uh, I, I, have a, 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 I have some idea. Of, mm -hmm. I, I don't have detailed history. But but you know, about 30 years ago, um, somebody had the very creative idea um, that the city should form a nonprofit corporation to do all their IT. Mm -hmm. And the great idea concept here was that they'd be able to outsource, or they'd, they'd be able to also do work for other government agencies and mm -hmm. get some economies of scale, and they'd be more flexible and agile than the government could be. And what ended up happening was they were, the, in many ways, the worst of, of being a nonprofit, being a government entity, uh, and being a private corporation. Um, and, and after a few decades of it going very poorly, um, it was finally closed down. Um, and what the decision was in closing it down was they, they essentially, the city essentially cut it into three parts and, and sold it off. I, mm -hmm. I say sold it off, obviously there was no, but they, 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 the workers went, the employees went and worked for one of three different um, large uh, IT companies, uh, Atos, CGI, um, who has be, since become infamous for their, their great work on healthcare.gov, and, um, and Xerox. Um, so now the city has very little of an IT department internally mm -hmm. and is heavily de dependent on these three outside c contractors. So where is that right balance? Obviously, it's a huge organization, um, 10,000 employees. Um, but where's the right balance between using large um, uh, government contractors, using uh, small 
uh, San Diego based IT companies and doing things in house. How, how do we how do we mix and match that to get the best results for for San Diego? That's a really good question, and I think it's a matter of us. I, I always like doing things locally. I like the idea of us really sourcing our all of our work locally because then it feeds right back into our economy and supports our local economy. And we are we've got a great tech industry here that should be growing and we should be facilitating that as much as possible. So for me, it makes sense that we are actually doing that actively. Um, and there, there are really good, strong companies that are out there that are not giant companies with possibly like decades of government like history necessarily working or contract history with government. But these are companies that work um, in enterprise already that other bis large businesses and other enterprises rely on to do secure, good, stable work, you know, and so I think the capacity is out there. The capacity is there for us to really be able to access those companies and work with them and be willing to bring them in. I think I think government should be inclusive and not exclusive whenever possible and for me that includes our business and tech industry, especially, you know, our innovators. I think that we should be fostering what they're doing. So, you know, I understand why government historically uses these large companies that are, you know, that have, like I said, decades of contract history, right? Because there's these relationships, and there's a stability, and there's a certain sense of, we know that they'll get the work done somehow, right? Um, but, you know, we know also that a lot of our younger companies, our up-and-coming companies, are the ones that are doing some really good, innovative work for, you know, less money and less cost to taxpayers that is actually just as powerful, if not more powerful, than what some of those older, you know, for lack of a better phrase, Soviet era, <laughs> you know, kind of uh, legacy software companies or, 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 you know, companies are doing. So I'd love to be able to see us fostering and um, empowering those group, those uh, local our local industry to do that. So a big part of the reason that 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 I think we don't see that is is the way government uh, contracting works. Mm -hmm. the, the RFP process mm -hmm. is is cumbersome. Yes. It certainly heavily biases past experience. Yes. Not necessarily even past success, mm -hmm. but it's past experience. Um, and so many small companies are aren't interested or able to go through that. Mm -hmm. um, but the RFP process is also in place for some very good reasons in preventing corruption. Sure. But would you, you um, for IT in particular, um, support scrapping or radically changing the RFP process? Have you given some thought to how that could be better for, for, for technology? I, you know, I've actually thought a little bit about it, not a whole lot, but I do feel like it could be definitely altered, and it should be, to be honest. Um, like you say, the RFP process definitely favors those who've got lots of experience with the governmental agency, whatever that is, and it is cumbersome. I mean, writing grants and writing proposals is it's something that most smaller companies don't have capacity for. They don't have someone who's actually able to sit there and like do and write and plug those things out. So, I think that it'd be great for us to actually go out and do outreach. You know, do outreach where we're actually saying, hey, let's see um, who's out out there that wants to do this work, come and show us, pitch to us, you know, what it is that you want to do. I mean, technology these days, especially in innovation um, tech, you know, field, industry, it's all about the pitch, right? It's about doing these pitch days and that kind of stuff. We should, the city should be facilitating some of that. So some of our, our work should be around that. It might not all pan out, and there definitely does have to be some sort of um, documented, you know, proposaling process because that's the way we are. Otherwise, there's no transparency, and you know, that you know, as you say, corruption can happen. But as much as possible, we should look at at um, new and innovative ways of approaching this. Like the, like I said, inter enterprise is doing it already. You know, we can do it too, and we can catch up, and it costs us less, and it'll actually bear out better fruit for all of us. I really think that that's important. So with the ideas like the pitch fest, um, mm -hmm. and, and I think most of us in, in the, the tech community have really gotten excited about, about more agile ways of, of, of doing software development and, and moving very quickly. And mm -hmm. um, that, that's obviously very different than government uh, uh, when the, the, what used to be called the Rules Committee uh, 
passed the open data uh, policy, they all patted themselves on the back at how quickly it got done. It only took slightly more than a year. Right, right. So, so how, how would you, you know, bring, I, I, I love the idea of, of a pitch fast, but what else can we do to make government move faster and be more agile? Um, you know, we're seeing these problems with, um, with things like uh, Uber and things uh, uh, where, where government regulations and laws Airbnb. Airbnb. Yeah. That are they, they're 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 be, they're not able to keep up mm -hmm. with the innovation that's happening in the, the the world. So how do we get government to move faster? That's a really good question. And if I think I think if uh, if we any of us had the solution to that, we would again be, you know rock star lottery winners or something. <laughs> um, I think, you know, one way I, w I would like, one of the things you mentioned earlier was that, you know, being able, the Public Records Act, you know, making that transparent, right? And I think part of it is to just make the process transparent where we, when there's a process in place, whatever that is, whether it's for a proposal or whether it's for a, um, you know, something moving through the rules committee or what have you, there should be a dashboard. There should be something that we've created that allows people to get on and actually see and track where we are so that people can say, oh my god, this has been sitting in committee for eight and a half months and you know, it's this little itty bitty <laughs> thing, why aren't you moving on it? We can be held accountable that way and we, and you know, it's not to say that we shouldn't have thoughtful measured responses to things and that we shouldn't really be thinking things through, but bureaucracy for bureaucracy's sake is completely I, I have it's nonsense. I have no I have no patience for it. So I think it's important for us to really look at how do we streamline our processes and if we can't streamline our processes, let's show the public and get them to make us, you know? So I really, you know, I still you know, I feel even if I become a city council member that I'll still be a resident and citizen of San Diego first and foremost and I'm going to be pushing to make sure that we get the things happening that the rest of us want to see happen which is answers and solutions that happen in a timely manner. So, and sometimes it's a squeaky wheel that gets the grease, right? So I would like to make sure that we, we uh, find ways to hear the squeaking. Um. So, the you, you mentioned the bureaucracy, and I mean, at the, at the end of the day, what 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 you what we have in the city is a lot of people doing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So I want to turn a little bit and talk about technology as it relates to people. Mm -hmm. So we've been without an IT director right. in the city of San Diego for seven months now. Mm -hmm. um, the last one resigned to uh, take a different job, and. Uh, we had an interim one for a while who I believe came from the Parks Department or something like that. Um, no, no, no previous IT experience. Mm -hmm. uh, now, now we have, a, I think, a second interim one, but, but again, somebody without any IT experience. And um, this is obviously a, a bit of a problem when, when we have a department being run by people who don't really know what that department does very well. Right. Um, you can imagine if the police, the uh, uh, chief of police came from the parks department, how much people would would uh, uh, rise up about that. Mm -hmm. But there, we, we, we clearly have a problem with trying to get a qualified IT director. How do we get better people in technology to work for the city of San Diego? That's a, you know, that's a good question. I get this question a lot about educators, about everything. And I think it comes down to us actually, for a qualified, top-notch, you know, really, really, really capable technology director, you've got to be able to compete with the other jobs that are being offered and the other opportunities that they're being offered. So it comes down a bit to one, compensation, right? So making sure that people are being compensated and they've got, you've got attractive compensation packages for them. But beyond that, also giving them the, um, the capacity to actually make the changes they want to see made. Um, I think that's a problem when we're talking about the bureaucracy that we see in, in, the, in, city, in the city, in the city departments. Um, people will come in and they want to do things, but again, you know, all those layers, quick as molasses. It can be very frustrating. I, I can imagine how frustrating that is for someone coming in from the tech industry, which moves like this, right? I mean, it's like, it's like grease lightning sometimes. So, um, so that, it, we'd have to, we'd have to be able to, one, you know, say, you know, we know you're getting paid this much at Google, but why don't you come here instead? There's that, there, there's that kind of, you know, a thing, a issue or challenge. And then the other thing would be, 
if you come, we will let you we will let you do the work we're hiring you to do. And I think that oftentimes we don't always let people do that. So sticking with the, the, the human issues, mm -hmm. uh, you obviously have had a lot of support from, from the labor unions. Mm -hmm. um, part of the nature of technology is, is on a certain level, what we're trying to do with technology is eliminate labor. Right. Um, automate things that, that, that currently take people pushing paper around. Mm -hmm. Are, are you concerned? Is that going to be an issue? Are we, we going to have uh, city employees trying to prevent us from improving technology because they're afraid of losing their jobs? I don't think so. I think that the city employees actually want to see the city departments and the city processes get more efficient themselves. I don't think they like it. I mean, if you talk with them, they're also very frustrated by the challenges that they're constantly coming up against and the fact that they aren't able to effectively do their work sometimes. So I think that if you approach them and said, hey, be part of the solution and help us figure out how to do this, they'd be willing to do that. And we may find that they actually have some solutions already, that they have insights into the way the work should get done. And I also think that we'll also find that, you know, it's, Yes, absolutely. We want to be able to make sure that there are good jobs for people in the city. In the city, but there shouldn't be jobs for job sakes. Again, you know, it should really be about whether or not these rules are necessary. Because no, I'm going to tell you this straight out too. No union wants to be seen as like you know people holding up the process because they're just trying to hang on to something. I mean. I, I, I really think that it's actually a misunderstanding about what they do sometimes. I, I think that they're actually much more open to being able to do it. They just want to have a meaningful voice in the process. So, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, you're right. Technology will cut out jobs. That, that's, that's kind of one of the issues that we're facing as a larger society and as a global society, right? I mean, what do we do once robots are doing all the work, right? What will, how will we feed people? So that's just a bigger problem in general. But um, it, we have to balance it. We have to balance it against the fact that we can do this work better for cheaper. Um, and then we can also balance it against the fact that, you know, what can those folks do? What, what other kinds of roles can they play that haven't been filled so far because they've been so bogged down in doing the work that they're currently doing? Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. It does. Um, uh, so last thing with, 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 with uh, people and with staff, uh, your staff, mm -hmm. you said that you were, were considering hiring a statistician for yeah, your office. Absolutely. Uh, it's important to me that the stuff we do, the work we do in City Hall and in our City Council offices and for our constituents actually is done well and done meaningfully and that we've got good outcomes. So I want someone who can actually crunch numbers for us and tell us, you know what, here's, here's, here's what we, were, we thought we were going to do and here's what actually happened instead. You know, that kind of thing is a really important, um, it, that's just an important component, I think, of any good governance or any kind of accountable system. So, yes, I'm sorry, I didn't, I, you kind nope, of that, you that, that, before that, you. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that was it. Okay, all right. Um, so, so um, my, my, really, my, the last question I, I wanted to ask you about was, was the local tech community, mm -hmm. um, uh, not just the people here today, but but all the startups, um, uh, all the folks at, at, at bigger companies like Teradata, like Google, um, uh, like Qualcomm, how would you bring them into City Hall more? Mm -hmm. How would you get them more involved in helping move our city forward? You know, um, well, if I if I could wave my my magic city council pixie wand and like just make things so, I would start by creating and having an IT system or IT platform that actually had open IP so that folks could actually start doing that stuff on their own, that we could have, we could have, um, you know, we could have web service stuff where we where people are creating apps or, or applications that plug into the city and allow us to push data into the city and back out to the city, you know, so that folks can actually do that. I would also look for ways to I mean that can spur innovation, it can spur small business development, it can do all kinds of stuff. So like New York City they do their big city apps thing, right? Their their apps contest that they they've got um, the big apps. Right, cute. Apple, big apps. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what our pun will be, but, you know. Um, but they do that kind of contest, and I think that that's, while, you know, while the results so far of those contests are not necessarily, like, stunning or stellar, per se, um, or maybe have not produced the kinds of products that people were hoping would be produced, it's, 
it's a start. It's the fact that people, one, feel engaged and feel invited to do that kind of work. Two, I think that um, we need to have opportunities for our tech industry to really, really start to, and our startups and our innovators to really, you know, look at look at what we've got and look at our data, like like you said, and be able to plug help us help us like build stuff, plug it in, and you know, and as as much as possible while protecting you know people's privacy and that kind of thing, allow us to get work done. You know, and when you do that, when you actually engage folks through their work in in the city's process, then you're creating a whole other level of of civic engagement and ownership that is just unbelievable. So I think that that should be something that that we we seek to try and accomplish. It seems it just it, I don't yeah I the whole closed system thing is not something I love. I want it to be an open system. I want us to be able to have that kind of interchange both through our apps and, and, and through our technology and um, like, again, like I said, pushing data in, pushing, bringing, pulling data back, you know, out and that, just making sure that we're doing those things as, as well as possible. I, I hope somebody tweeted out that, that Carol Kim knows what a web service is. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't think there's too many candidates for office who, who, who actually understand what that concept is. Uh, um, well, you know, I, I'm not a technical person, but I love, I, I come from the education you know, um, I come from education, and one of the things I do is I, I, I love STEM education. So STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And the, the most exciting stuff for me when I'm out and um, doing the work and the research that I do in education is all about, it's all happening in the STEM industry, STEM fields, I mean, in, in those content areas, because that's where people are excited and are really building and innovating and doing interesting things. And it's not just the products that they're building, it's the way that they're teaching it, you know? It's, th there's this whole, it's this great um, environment and ecosystem that exists. So I'm a bit of a geek in that sense. I'm not actually technical, I can't code very well, but I've taken an Arduino class, so I know what a mic, you know, I know what an Arduino microprocessor is. I, I dragged my uh, my family to San Mateo for Maker Faire, you know, I mean, I love this stuff. I think it's so fun. I think it's so exciting. I go to like the digital media learning conferences. I mean, it's there's so much out there that we could be bringing in and um, bringing to bear here in in government and why shouldn't we? We should, as much as we can, while again, being thoughtful and careful about it, right? So, um, la last last thoughts, last words on, on, on why you're the, the, the tech candidate for District 6. Well, I know what a web service is. <laughs> <laughs> but um, beyond that, you know, I, I just, I, I love this stuff. This stuff like sets me alive. I mean, I, and I'm, I'm so excited about the opportunities that exist. In, in District 6 especially, we've got a real innovation industry happening. You know, we've got companies like Qualcomm that do, that are sort of these um, larger, more established, you know, Fortune 500 type companies that are doing techno good technology work. And then we've got little itty bitty startups like in Ansier Innovation, you know, and the, uh, doing all kinds of interesting things there too. So. It's, we've, there's so much, there's just so much, and I, I'm so excited, I want to be able to promote it and support it as much as I can, and I absolutely will, so I'll be pushing for it and advocating for it if, if I get elected, it's, it's going to be one of my hot topics for sure. Well, thank you for doing this, thanks for taking the time, um, yeah, if you have time, please, please stick around and talk to s some folks, and sure. thank all of you for, for, for being here.